but I'm asked to give a short presentation on this subject, how to build a sexual ethic. How to build a sexual ethic. Uh, my favorite quote from Groucho Marx is this, I think sex is here to stay. <laughs> and I think he's absolutely right about that. It's not a trend, it will not go away, so we better do some good thinking around the whole issue of sex. And if we are Christians, uh, of course we should not be shamed to discuss what God was not ashamed to create. So we should have a very open mind about all issues related to our bodies, to sexuality, to procreation, to relationships, because it was all in God's mind because before he gave it reality in creating this world. So he was thinking about it without blushing <laughs> or feeling ashamed, and we should do the same. <clears throat> Now, sexuality is a good thing, it's a strange thing, it can be a really bad thing, it can be a really evil thing. <laughs> it's such a strange phenomena if we think what the consequences of our sexuality can be. And sex can be a great joy in a person's life, and it can be something that is a, a, a wound or something that is really painful. If we think of everything that is possible sexually, we immediately realize that we need some guidelines. Not everything that can be done sexually should be done sexually. And that is not a Christian position. Every sane human being can realize not everything that is possible should be an actual reality. So are there any guidelines to separate what is good and healthy from what is destructive and evil? An individual needs to think about guidelines. A culture needs to be thinking about guidelines. How can we draw a line? Because we need to draw a line. In my country, which um, birthed the sexual revolution, there is still, and people were trying to get rid of all kinds of guidelines, there's a lot of discussion about where people have gone over the line and done the wrong uh, thing in terms of sexuality and hurted other people and hurted themselves. So this is an unavoidable question, where to draw the line and how to think when drawing the line. In, in, um, in my view, it's important not to think of isolated cases, uh, this issue or this issue. We need to find a more coherent overall framework to think about sexuality. <coughs> Listening to uh, my own culture, there are, of course, criteria thrown around. You can uh, hear some naive people say, well, it's about following your heart not realizing that the human heart is really a corrupt thing. There will not be much lines drawn if you follow your heart. More reasonable people would say, of course, you cannot follow your heart in every instance. You need to have some principles, like do not hurt anybody. As long as it is not hurtful for someone, that would be okay. Other people realize it, well, that is actually not enough. So some media have disclosed in Sweden a, a, um, a group of people who arranged so men could have sex with animals. And they were really clear on not hurting the animals. So reasonable people say, well, you need to move up the criteria one level. Okay, of course, follow your heart, that's a good thing, as long as it, you do not hurt anyone, and then adding, as long as it is between consenting adults. No animals, no children, no force, no violence, so do not hurt, and keep it between consenting adults. And most people in my country would say, 
Now, these are sufficient criteria, as long as it is consenting adults. But I don't, in my view, think through this. What then about prostitution? Well, it, it, it can be between consenting adults where you are not hurting each other. What about incest? Adult brothers and sisters? What about polygamy? In my country where most things are allowed, that is still not allowed. So we don't seem to draw the line coherently out from our own criteria. Because people are not supportive of incest between adults. So those criteria, they are good, but they are not sufficient. I'm not dismissing them, I'm just saying there needs to be things added. Here are things missing if we want a framework for sexuality. And I think there are two really glaring things missing. So what is missing? There is no connection to, firstly, to love. Love not in terms of emotion, but ter in terms of commitment of real love. And secondly, there is no connection to the body. No one talks about the physical aspect. Uh, biology is missing here. Even though we know that procreation is one of the essential parts of what sex is all about. So I don't think we are true to the reality of sex. And just to, to, to deepen this, and, and this is my main criticism towards my own culture, we are not true to the reality of sex. They think that we as Christians want to, to narrow and limit sex. My perspective is that my own culture is not true to the reality of sex. We are not saying the true things about what sex is. Let me uh, try to... Uh, to um, uh, to explain that. If we ask this question, how to understand the sexual union? W w what is it to have sex? To be sexually united to another person? Some people will say, well, that's physical, pl uh, physical pleasure. It's like a massage, but just an uh, unusually potent kind of uh, massage. So it's, it's a lovely thing to have your, your back or your, uh, your feet massaged. And sex is just the, the best kind of massage. Don't make it into anything bigger than that. Other people will say, well, it's actually more. It is an expression, an exchange of emotion. It's some, some kind of connection of meeting between two people. So there is more than just having a massage, which you, it, it, there is a dimension. There is some kind of relational <coughs> dimension to it. Uh, I would agree on both those. Of course, there is physical pleasure in sex. And of course, it, it, there should be an expression of, of love and connection and feelings. So I'm not criticizing those as such. But I think there is a, a deeper level, too, that sex is a unique sign of unity. It is a manifestation of belonging. And notice, everyone know, uh, knows this. When people who have had many different um, sexual relationships finally find the person they really want to share their lives with, then sex takes on this sign dimension. And then adultery becomes the ultimate threat to the whole relation because you have been united to another person. It destroys our unity. Now suddenly sex is something completely different. It's not just physical pleasure. It's not just exchanging emotion and having contact with another people, another person. You have broken the sign of our unique unity. Interestingly, in, in the judicial system, everyone respects this. 
you notice that we make a difference between physical assault and rape. Why? Isn't it both just a physical assault, just the different body parts involved? What's the difference being punished in the stomach and something, someone doing something with you sexually? Why should that be differentiated? Because there is a dimension to sex which is so obvious, which is so important, which is so deep. So it's a catastrophe to try to say it's the same thing. Deep down, everyone knows that there is more to sex than the physical. There is more to sex than just a point of connection. <coughs> There's more going on. Biologically, there are things that can help us to understand it. There are things in our own bodies who pushes in this direction to create this deep experience of unity. Uh, it's a hormone, oxytocin. It's a powerful hormone. I'm quoting from Psychology Today online. When we hug or kiss a loved one, oxytocin level, levels drive up. It also acts as a neurotransmitter in the brain. In fact, the hormone plays a huge role in pair bonding. Prayer voles, one of nature's most monogamous species, produce oxytocin oxytocin in spades. This hormone is also greatly stimulated during sex, birth, breastfeeding, the list goes on. So there's actually something in our body when we are having sex who helps us to feel united to the other person. The biblical perspective, perspective moving on from a more general, what we can see in reality, moving on to the biblical perspective, we have a, a very clear perspective on sex and sexual ethics in the Bible. And I would summarize it in three main points. The origin of sex is, is God. God created us male and female. It was all his idea. And the first thing God says to the human beings is have sex. Multiply. <laughs> Be fruitful. So God is not the distance from the area of sex. The sexual polarity, male and female, come from God. Not that God is male or female, but what is male and female within us reflects both dimensions something within God. We are called to reproduce, to become God's co-workers. And we do that through the sexual act. Therefore, there, it has a high status within a Christian framework. There is an absolute demarcation against Platonism or Gnosticism, every view that downgrades the body, the physical, the sexual. A Christian cannot do that. If you believe in the creation, in the incarnation, in the resurrection, that's out of the picture. We need to affirm what God has created and what he wants to fully redeem. The New Testament affirms this Old Testament view of creation. And it's the doctrines of demons that deny marriage and therefore sexual expression. Secondly, the context for sex in the Bible is love or the need for community. It's so moving in, in chapter 2 in Genesis that uh, Adam, the, or the man, uh, he has a fellowship with God. He's connected to God, but he's still missing something. So that's very provocatively, as if God were not enough. And God himself said, this is not good. He has just me. <laughs> it's not good that the man is alone. Of course, it's not that God is lacking anything. In all eternity, he is sufficient for every other being, of course. But this is God's way of underlining the way he has created us as relational, socially, social beings who needs relationship to our creator, but we also need the horizontal relationship of being related to someone that is like us, but are not identical, that are not us, but are like us. And the man is so happy when uh, uh, the woman is created, finally, 
someone who is not lower than him as the animals, higher than him as God, but is his equal on his level. Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. So the context for, for sex is the need for a lasting connection. They become one flesh. The chapter ends, or actually ends with this beautiful comment. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is not about nudism. It's not a lack of clothing, which is the, the main point. It is the openness. They had a real relationship. They did not hide. That with which we have been fighting th since the uh, fall, how on earth can I be honest, open, real in front of another person? How can we have a relationship without walls? They had it, and it was wonderful. And this is the context of male-female sexuality, the need for relationship, for connection, for love. Thirdly, the place for sex is marriage. The key text in the Bible here is uh, beyond question, Genesis 2.24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's quoted by Jesus. He quotes from both Genesis 1 and this verse from Genesis 2 when he is confronted and asked about marriage and divorce and, and how to think about this area of life. And Paul quotes the same verse when he talks about male and female in the family, so it seems to be it's both, both the starting point for the Christian understanding and the main uh, starting point for Jesus when he's discussing the issues and for Paul. If we then analyze this verse in Genesis 2.24, since it's such a crucial verse, I like the way John Stott uh, used to do it. Where he says, we have here a definition of marriage. Marriage is a monogamous religion, uh, relation. It's a man and his wife. It's not polygamy. It's a heterosexual relation. It's a man and his wife. It's a relationship which created by a change of social status. You leave your father and mother. <clears throat> which, of course, it was a big thing in antiquity, to start a new social unity. It's supposed to be a lifelong fidelity to hold fast to. And this is completed in the sexual union. You become one flesh. It's important here to understand the Christian view of marriage. Marriage is a covenant. It's expressively said so in Malachi 2, your wife by covenant. So a marriage is a covenant. The covenant is created, established by the promises and then confirmed in the sexual union. It's not created by having sex. I think a, a number of Christians received the teaching that if you have sex with someone, you become married to that one. That has very difficult practical implications in a country like Sweden if everyone is married to everyone they have had sex with. But it's, but it's actually not the biblical view. Nowhere in the Bible is a marriage established with two people having sex. When two people who are not married are having sex, it's called pornea. It's an immoral sexual act. Marriage is established by the promise that you promise the covenant to give yourself to the other person. And then it's confirmed in the sexual union when you uh, do with your body what you already have said with your mouth. I want my life to be one with you. The covenant is legally recognized. <coughs> Finally, why do we relate sex as Christians in this exclusive way to marriage. There are two principal reasons. The sexual act expresses unity. It's our deepest body language. Sexuality, where we, where we with our body are saying, I'm one with you, isn't true if we are not prepared to say that with our mouth. 
and secondly, the, the sexual act procreates. That would be the two main reasons. We should be willing to accept the fruits of sex. Children are entitled to their mother and father. And then there are two pragmatic reasons, for health reasons and for relationship reasons. And if we have had have more time, I could have shown you some really interesting new research about the quality of marriage relationships related to how people have lived sexually before they married. And it's absolutely clear that statistically your marriage will be much stronger if you live according to a biblical understanding of sex. I'm sorry, it's a huge subject. I have so much more to share, but our time is out and uh, uh, we need to honor our schedule and the, the next speaker. So unfortunately, I don't think I've, uh, I have the time to take any questions uh, right now. So you have to attack me on, on other uh, occasions and confront me with all the bad things I've said. <laughs>